So, hello again. Having looked at the different hydrates that forms, calcium hydroxide, calcium silicate hydrates, these phases that come from the illuminates, now we're going to look at how these different hydrates form in time, the kinetics of the hydration reaction. Here we're going to look first of all at the hydration of the calcium silicate phases. And uh, this shows the typical hydration curve from, for tricalcium silicate. What you see is that initially we get a very high rate of heat evolution. And then very quickly the rate of heat evolution, that's to say the rate of reaction, uh, falls away. And we get this period of uh, very slow reaction during a few hours. And this is usually called the induction period. Now, from a practical point of view, this is very important because this induction period gives us the time to mix our cement or concrete, to move it onto site, to place it in the forms and uh, produce the kind of uh, el concrete element we want to have in our buildings. And then after typically something like three hours, uh, the reaction takes off again. We have what's called the acceleration period. Uh, after about 10 hours, then it starts to slow down again in what we call the deceleration period. And after the first day or so, the uh, rate of heat reaction is really quite low, even though at 24 hours, we may only have formed about 25% of the or less of the final strength of, uh, of our concrete. So there's quite a lot happening after the first day, but it's happening much more slowly. So it's more difficult to uh, follow from the point of view of this heat evolution. And in particular, in terms of these kinetics, there are two questions that have occupied researchers. First of all, this initial slowdown. Why do we get this initial slowing down? And then why do we get this second slowing down for the deceleration period? And in these modules, we're going to look individually at three separate periods. We're going to look at this first period of the initial heat, heat evolution and the induction period. Then we're going to look at this main heat evolution peak here. And then we're going to look at the slow ongoing reaction. There's quite a lot happening in this final period. Uh, in fact, a lot of the strength is developing during this time, but it's quite difficult to see because it's quite difficult to uh, measure what's happening due to the very low rate of heat evolution. Right, so in this first one on the kinetics, we're going to look at this induction period. It seems kind of odd that the reaction should start fast and then slow down. And to explain this, what has classically been advanced has, has been this idea that we have this protective membrane forming around the grains. And many people over the years have advanced this kind of hypothesis. Uh, then there's been all kinds of different theories as to why this layer should suddenly disappear. And this is, why, in fact, one of the main weaknesses of this theory, that uh, nobody really has come up with a, a coherent uh, idea of why the uh, membrane forms and then suddenly disappears after some time. But perhaps nowadays, it's more important to realize that there's really no evidence for this protective layer. Uh, back in the 60s, when people first came up with this idea, um, the fact we couldn't see it wasn't really too much of a problem. But nowadays, where we have very advanced characterization tools, um, this, is, this is really a big issue. I mean, it's like the emperor's new clothes. Uh, here we see a picture which I think is particularly important. Um, was lent to me by Luke Niccolo. And uh, what we see, this was made in a cryo uh, SEM. So in a cryo SEM, what happens? You take a cement paste, you freeze it, you break it, you put the broken, frozen sample into the microscope and then sublime the water. So it's a kind of gentle way of drying, but you do have to eventually remove the water because electrons can't penetrate through water. So, um, you know, you have to remove the water first. And what we can see here, we can see this is an alite grain here, which has been fractured. And on the surface of this alite grain, we see the hydrate. So here's CSH here. Um, we don't really see uh, much calcium hydroxide here. We see a little bit of ettringite, for example, down here, a little bit up here. But very clearly, these hydrates 
don't give a continuous membrane on the top of this cement grain. And in fact, uh, we can see these pits. We're going to come back to these pits. They're very, very important. And particularly on these pits, we can see there's no indication of any kind of covering. And um, this micrograph is at quite a high resolution. The bar here tells you about 100 nanometers scale. So, um, you know, even if there was a layer only a few nanometers thick, we would expect to see some indication of it. So really this uh, theory of the protective membrane that most people have been promulgating for a number of years now really just doesn't hold up to examination. And here's another um, sequence where we can see, um, in this case, what's happening underwater. So this sequence was taken in the wet cell of atomic force microscope. And as we run the sequence, as, as we do here, here as we run the sequence, we can see that we get this rough area forming here. And then after a while, we start to see these steps. Okay, kind of these steps here. And these steps uh, are moving as we have dissolution at those steps. So those are the particularly important things to observe here. First of all, a rough area forming and then moving to this um, steps which retreat. Now, um, another observation which completely, um, to my mind, refutes the protective layer uh, theory is this experiment we did about um, annealing. So we took a light and the one part of the a light was then heated up to anneal it to remove defects. And you can see here this dramatic effect the annealing has on the hydration kinetics. It really extends this induction period. But after this induction period, then the hydration seems pretty much the same as it was for the unannealed sample. And over here, we see the first peak and we see for the annealed sample, the initial heat evolution is much lower than from the non-annealed sample. Now, how could this be explained by a protective layer theory? Um, if we were going to say, well, maybe the layer is thicker in the case of the annealed sample, that doesn't correlate with what we see from the first evolution peak. And, you know, if we had a different kind of layer forming, uh, why should we expect the hydration to be the same afterwards? So this is just one example of uh, experimental results that cannot be explained by this theory. And more results uh, are discussed in the paper by Juillon et al., which can be found in the references. So the alternative theory is really just to say, well, we have a nucleation and growth. And nucleation and growth is a very well-known phenomenon in many reactions, in metals, in, in, from aqueous solutions, uh, many, many chemical processes. Uh, we can make a simple model of nucleation and growth, as is shown on the left here, where we have these little islands, which are the representing the nuclei of CSH. And as they grow, they give this acceleration peak. So in terms of the acceleration peak, as we'll see in the next uh, module, this can be very well explained by nucleation and growth. But what we're missing here is any explanation of why we have this slowdown um, from the first dissolution. So to understand this slowdown better, um, I think we, we need to go to the work that's been done in geochemistry. Now here, I want to introduce this idea of dissolution being a negative form of growth. And the little diagrams uh, over on the left here will probably be familiar to those of you who studied classical metallurgy and material science and have looked at the uh, solidification of metals. So it's well known in the solidification of metals, solidification of just about anything in fact, that we don't get the solid forming exactly at the melting temperature the temperature of fusion, as indicated here. And this is because we have supercooling, and we need this supercooling because we need to go to uh, this point here where there's a, 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 an energy difference between the liquid and solid, and that energy difference is sufficient to give the surface energy to form the first nuclei. Okay? So those of you unfamiliar with that, 
just look at any classical um, material science textbook, you'll find a more detailed explanation. Now, when we come to think about dissolution, um, if we have dissolution from a smooth surface, this is always also going to require energy for, e for forming the extra surface. So here we have imaginary surface and here we have a little bit of dissolution going on and you see dissolution means that we have to get this extra surface uh, that is shown there and th in this case this extra surface energy needs to come from the undersaturation of the solution that's to say if the solution contains less ions than it can do at saturation it has a, uh, a higher energy it can used can be used to produce this extra surface so this analysis has been developed quite um, rigorously in the field of geochemistry and in the next slide we see two examples from work published in this area so the first uh, example shows pictures of the different modes of diff dissolution of quartz done at quite high temperature and um, I really want to underline that because of this idea of dissolution as being the negative of growth we see that the undersaturation is increasing as we go to the left and the dissolution rate is increasing as we go down so this is kind of the opposite to what we'd expect on a normal access system and then we see here for the quartz that are very high degrees of undersaturation We've got a lot of excess energy due to that undersaturation, so we can form a lot of these very small uh, edge pits, these 2D vacancy islands. As we move a little bit closer to saturation, we see that these um, edge pits tend to focus on um, dislocations or other kind of defects we have in the crystal structure. And as we come close to saturation, we change radically the mode of dissolution. In for, instead of forming pits, we form this step retreat. And remember that picture we saw in the AFM of dissolving, dissolving alite, how we saw that first of all we formed a rough surface, which is um, similar to these first three pictures here, and then we went to step retreat. Now on the right here, we see how this translates quantitatively in terms of the uh, rate of dissolution as a function of the delta G. Now the delta G is just, can just be derived from the difference between the, uh, the equilibrium saturation and the actual undersaturation. So what you see from the experimental points here is we get this sudden transition from a fast dissolution at high delta G's to a slow dissolution and this transition occurs when we're still in fact quite far away from the equilibrium saturation which is here and this step function cannot at all be captured by these other lines on here which shows what you would predict from a classical transition state theory as is used in chemistry. So this transition between fast dissolution and slow dissolution is, is quite abrupt. Now the question is, this has been well proven for, to, for many minerals, but does it apply for cement minerals? Well, you know, my first question is, well, why not? Um, you know, if it applies for all other minerals, why should the minerals before having cement clinker be any different? And in fact, we see that they're not any different. This is a classical experiment done by Patrick Juillant a few years ago in my laboratory. What we see in the middle here, we see uh, the, the alite, which was freshly produced in the laboratory. And then he took this fractured alite and either dipped it in pure water. And when we dipped it in pure water, as you see on the, on the left-hand side, what we see is that very quickly we get this very rough surface forming. Um, with these etch pits because we've got a high undersaturation with the pure water we rapidly form these etch pits and we can see this got very strong crystallographic relationship because we've actually got two a light grains here and we can see that one grain is being heavily attacked whereas the other grain is remaining relatively unattacked because it's probably in the wrong uh, orientation Whereas on the right hand side here, if we take exactly the same A light and now put it in saturated lime solution, so saturated lime solution is getting much closer, much less undersaturated 
with respect to A light, we see that now we've got no longer got the energy required to give us these edge pits and we've got really just smooth surface. So that was really the defining experiment. And then when we made a, a theoretical analysis, we could see on the left here from this classical paper of Jouillet en Dedal in 2009, uh, we see that this is the undersaturation and the dissolution rate has this uh, step function, which occurs around the level of saturation of Portlandite. And then uh, Luc Niccolo and André Nonna uh, really showed that we could have exactly the same behavior um, experimentally. So here we have a theoretical treatment here, experimental treatment here, and quantitatively, they really match extremely well. We could then take this same a theoretical framework, but apply it in a completely different way. So if we now take um, a model where we're trying to fit the um, calorimeter curves, we can find that we get the best fitting here when we get uh, values for this uh, step function, exactly the same as I showed you in the previous slide. Coming to the summary here, I think what's very important in this module is that the most common theory you find in all textbooks really is just not true. I mean, I'm sorry, I know this is uh, very destabilizing for uh, people trying to learn about cement chemistry, but it's really very important. You know, it's, it's not uncommon in science for one theory to be prevalent for a long period of time and then somebody to come along and say that no it's not like that um, those of you who studied the history of science maybe know about the phlog phlogiston which was kind of a negative oxygen which was believed to uh, explain a lot of things in, in, in metals so you can go and read about that in your spare time but really, I want you to come away from this to really understand that there is no protective layer forming. There's no experimental evidence for it, and most of the experimental results cannot be explained by that. That on the other hand, we can explain this initial slowdown by dissolution as a function of the undersaturation. And this has a very sound theoretical framework from geochemistry, there's excellent agreement between theory, experimental measurements, and what we can do with modeling. And really, we can explain all the experimental observations. So thank you. And I hope that's been uh, useful for you.